Hi, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Um, on this channel, Outbreak News TV, and on the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, uh, we keep a close eye on a lot of different infectious diseases. And one of the ones we keep an eye on, probably much more than most places, is the raccoon roundworm, uh, Bayless Ascaris procyanus. And every once in a blue moon, uh, a story pops up on this. Um, sometimes they're tragic, sometimes not so much. In, in this case, I uh, found a news report out of Oklahoma where a young toddler uh, contracted this uh, very potentially very dangerous uh, parasite. And uh, I want to go ahead and share the news report with you um, real quickly. It's a couple, two or three minutes long. And then I'm just going to talk about Bayless Ascaris, uh, give you a little rundown on it if you're not familiar with it. There's, I got plenty of videos on here, um, me talking about it, uh, me interviewing an ex experts on it. So uh, I encourage you to check that out too. Just search for Bayless Ascaris or search for Raccoon Roundworm and a very good chance you're gonna be able to find those videos. But let me go ahead and uh, share the uh, news report out of Oklahoma. Let's see. I'm Kara Morrison. First at 10, a prior family wants to raise awareness after they nearly lost their toddler to a rare illness, a parasite. Two News Oklahoma's Katie Kelleher spoke with the Barnes family about the struggles they've gone through to get answers for their son. Colton and Alicia Barnes, a one-year-old son, writer, has been in a hospital since just after Thanksgiving. They spent a long time just searching for answers about his rare illness. Now they want to warn other parents. Because there were plenty of days when we weren't sure if we would ever bring him home again. Colton and Alicia Barnes noticed something wasn't right with their 17-month-old son, Ryder, at Thanksgiving. He wasn't eating, he was cranky, and he started limping. They took him to a doctor that Monday where he got some medicine and was sent home. The next day, he wasn't any better, so Alicia went to a second doctor, and after a blood test, Ryder was admitted to St. Francis Children's Hospital. Two days into it, you know, they were saying it was just a virus, and then all of a sudden he went limp. So while we were there, he got way worse in about 48 hours. So at that point, we were like, okay, this is more than just a virus, what's going on? After a week at St. Francis, and still no answers, they took Ryder to Texas Children's Hospital in Houston to see a pediatric neurologist. And after 28 days in a hospital, they got news that it was Bayless scarus, a parasite found in raccoons, transferred to children by putting dirt in their mouths. It's so rare, the closest place to test for it was in Canada. There have been less than 30 cases of it in the U.S. in the past 40 years. That's when you know you're just in like really uncharted territory. When the doctors come in and they say, we, we don't know. They literally don't have no progress. They said, so. we, we never, none of, we don't even know someone who knows someone who has had a case of this. Now, Ryder is back in Oklahoma at the Children's Center Rehabilitation Hospital in Bethany, where he's having to relearn how to do Ooh, everything. Yay, Ryder! Alicia says he couldn't hold his head up when he left Houston. Now, he's eating and drinking. I mean, there's no light way to he's, he's not himself anymore, but... He can relearn it, and there's that hope there. No one has ever told us he's never going to see or walk or talk. It's just they don't know. Alicia and Colton say their faith, friends, and family are keeping them going. And if they've learned anything, it's to never stop searching for answers. Don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion or demand <laughs> a second opinion if needed. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly a big part of what saved his life is advocating for him. Ryder will be at the rehabilitation hospital for seven more weeks. Then he finally will get to go home to his family. Now, Colton and Leach are simply asking for prayers for a full recovery. Katie Kelleher, 2 News, Oklahoma. All right. Well, interesting report. Um, God bless his family. Uh, give them the strength to get through this and uh, be, be with the child. Um, uh, looking at this, they seem like they're fortunate uh, that the uh, the young boy is uh, at least in rehab and, and showing some kind of signs of recovery. 
so yeah, that's a that's a tough story. There's no doubt about it. That's a really tough story, and I and then my heart really goes out to that family. Um, so Bayless Ascaris procyonis. Uh, this is this is what the child got infected with, and this is a roundworm that's found in the small intestines of raccoons, and the raccoons excrete the eggs of this parasite in their feces, and it's a lot of them. They, it's it's <laughs> hundreds of thousands of eggs per you know defecation and the and the and the eggs are incredibly incredibly resistant to the environment so they can stay alive in the soil um for years years and years um basically the only thing that can really kill the eggs is heat right boiling water or a flame um so we're talking you know this is you know, raccoon latrines, these are these communal places where raccoons defecate. You can be talking about millions and millions of eggs um, found in the feces and the soil that's surrounding the latrines. Um, the raccoon roundworm is pretty indiscriminate in which animals it can infect. So it, it can be rabbits or squirrels or birds. Um, many times animals pick it up. Um, by getting the eggs in their fur, and then while they're grooming, they ingest the eggs. Uh, humans uh, get infected by accidentally ingesting the eggs from the environment, uh, from the raccoon feces, from contaminated water, or uh, things that have raccoon feces on it. it. Could be tree bark, it could be you know anything like that. And like I said, they defecate in these favorite areas, which are called raccoon latrines. These are typically, but not always, like the base of a tree, the fork, uh, forks of a tree, fallen logs, on rooftops, on decks, and wood piles, uh, all kinds of places like that. Um, in both animals and in humans, the eggs, when you ingest these eggs, they hatch in the intestine and then the larva will migrate throughout the body. Uh, they typically will end up in three, three different areas. And, just the the viscera somewhere in the tissue they'll they'll cruise around the body and find a place where they stop and a lot of times it's in some of the organs which or the tissues which uh, typically causes much less pathology it can end up in the eyes where you can see uh, uh, patients that become blind due to this uh, parasite and then the central nervous system, the brain, um, where you see brain damage and, uh, and coma and death. Um, and these all are called uh, larval migraines, where the larva migrates to. So it's ocular larval migraines. It's neural larval migraines. Um, the people that typically get infected, and it's, it's, it is relatively rare as far as the ones that get serious infection, you know, several dozen in the United States over, you know, several decades. Um, and then there's, you know, studies out there that say that there's also a lot of uh, asymptomatic, well, there's some, asymp some asymptomatic cases, which they've seen, you know, do an antibody test. And these are likely the ones where they did not go to the brain and it did not go to the eye, the larva didn't. Um, young kids um, and and people with geophagia uh, this desire to eat dirt pika this desire to eat strange things things you wouldn't normally eat like maybe say tree bark or um, start chewing on the bottom of a shoe or something like that these are the type of people that are most likely to get infected uh, the treatment is generally ineffective um, it really depends on if, if it gets treatment gets started early enough. So the physician has to have an idea that there's even the chance that this is the likely culprit. And you could kill the larva before it gets to the central nervous system, for example. Uh, Bayless ascaris is found both in the urban and the rural environments. Uh, its prevalence varies on geographic area. Um, we see it a lot more heavily in the uh, 
northern areas of the U.S. and it decreases in the southern states. Um, you see it a lot on the West Coast, parts of Canada, um, parts of the Midwest. So it is geographically dependent. Um, so how do you prevent this potentially life-threatening infection? Well, there's several steps. Um, A, you got to avoid direct contact with raccoons, especially their feces. Um, do not feed them. Do not keep them. Adopt them as pets. Uh, uh, you should discourage raccoons from living in and around your home. Uh, prevent access to food. Uh, close off access to attics and basements. These are places where raccoons love to end up. Uh, if you have a sandbox in the yard, make sure you keep it covered. Uh, this is a nice place where they would like to start a latrine. And it's not just raccoons. Other animals that carry other types of roundworms, like cats, for example, would like to defecate in the sandbox too. Um, uh, if you have a fish pond you know, on your property, remove it because they like to uh, eat the fish. Uh, bird feeders are, can be a problem. Uh, keep your property and the brush cleared the best you can so uh, the raccoons won't want to make a den on your property. And just, like I said, avoid areas where uh, it might be contaminated with raccoon feces. Uh, right, The base of a tree, uh, stumps, large rocks wood piles, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have to get it removed, the feces removed, because uh, that's, to me, that's a biohazard. Um, you, you may have to get uh, professional, you know, help on that. Um, the raccoon feces and all the material that's contaminated with the feces has to be, you know, removed and burned, buried and sent to a landfill. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a tricky situation. So just um, keep that in mind. Consult with somebody um, if you find you have raccoon latrines on your property and, and figure out the best way to handle it. Uh, the CDC does offer some um, information on, you know, places you can contact and how, how you can handle it. You know, some of it depends on the age of the feces too. So it all... There's a lot of variants, but it is a very, very serious thing. And it's something you want to be really decked out in PPE to, to, to handle. But anyway, again, God bless this family. I hope they make it through. I hope the, the baby um, uh, has a, a decent recovery. And uh, well, I'll see you next time on the show. And if you liked what you saw, again, subscribe, uh, comment below, uh, share it with your friends. And uh, I'll see you next time.